<laughs> Boudreau from Louisiana staggered home very late. Most of you know my background, so I've dealt with drunks my whole life, and I was one for years. And I, I'm always afraid of being drunk because I know how stupid I'd be. Some of you have learned how to be uh, good drunks, evidently. I'm not talking to y'all. I'm on TV. Uh, but I never was a good drunk. So like Boudreau, who staggered home very late on another evening with his drinking buddy, Thibodeau. How many know if you're going to get drunk, have a buddy? He took off his shoes to avoid waking his wife, Doris. He tiptoed as quietly as he could toward the stairs leading to the upstairs bedroom, but misjudged the bottom step. As he caught himself by grabbing the banister, his body swung around and it landed heavily on his rump. A whiskey bottle in each back pocket broke and made the landing especially painful. Managing not to yell, Boudreau sprung up, pulled down his breeches, and looked in the hall mirror to see that his cheeks were cut and bleeding. He managed to quietly find a full box of Band-Aids and began putting a Band-Aid as best he could on each place he saw blood. He then hid the now almost empty box and shuffled and stumbled his way to bed. In the morning, Boudreaux woke up with searing pain in both his head and his rear. And Doris started staring at him from across the room. She said, you were drunk again last night, weren't you, Boudreaux? Boudreaux said, come on, Cherie. Why you say such a mean thing? Well, Doris said, it could be the open front door. It could be the broken glass at the bottom of the stairs. It could be the drops of blood trailing through the house. It could be your bloodshot eyes. But mostly, it's all them band-aids stuck on the downstairs mirror. You know why I get you laughing? Because a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. I learned a long time ago, if you ain't laughing, it's hard to get truth down people. I was asked by my wife yesterday. She worked on the tower. She said I had to go to a funeral, so she went up on the tower, and, which is a 40-foot tower, and she's helping people zip off. Now, it's a 40-foot tower, but my wife is only 4 foot 2 and uh, so she's struggling to get the rope down to people. And again, she's four two. I'm six foot, so she's struggling. And when I got home from the funeral, she's laying down in the bed. Her cheeks are red, and her feet are hurting. She said, "How do you do it?" And I smiled and I said, "Cause I'm driven. I'm driven. I'm driven in the mornings when I get up. I'm driven to move through the day." I'm driven till the, my energy is sapped. I only have so much in me, but I'm driven. Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. I'm driven, uh, purpose-driven. I was purpose-driven before a book was written. I was purpose-driven before other pastors were even talking about purpose. I met men who helped define it in my life, but I realized that when I met Jesus, he changed my life. I have no idea what my life would have been like had I not met him, Diane. It changed me. It turned me around. He shifted me. He gave me direction. He removed loneliness from my life. He began to move addictions from me. Uh, things changed. It, it, it shifted in me. And I can tell you now that if you are not driven, something will drive you. Something will drive you. Something will push you in a way maybe you don't even want to go. You'll get up and you'll just start drifting, but you're driven. You're, you're, you're going somewhere. You know, the verb drive is to guide, to control, to direct. In America, there are some driven by uh, problems, some driven by pressure, some by a deadline, some get a debt and they have to be able to pay it. So that will drive them. We, we're driven by painful memories or a haunting fear or an unconscious belief. There are hundreds of circumstances and values and emotions that drive people's lives and understanding what's driving you is a key to reaching them. Now, here's some ways that you don't want to be driven. Well, some are, are people are driven by guilt. 
They spend their entire lives running from regret or hiding their shame. Guilt-driven people are manipulated by memories. They have memories that bring, uh, come up, and it describes most people today wandering through life without a purpose. Some people are driven by resentment. They, they're full of resentment. They hold on to their hurts and never get over them. Instead of releasing their pain through forgiveness, they rehearse it over and over in their minds. They get on the phone and they rehearse it over and over and over again. And what happens in their life, first off, they clam up. We clam up. We, we're full of resentment, so we clam up. We don't say nothing. What's wrong with you? Nothing. <laughs> it's the way you said nothing that tells me that it's something. Amen, parent. You know your kids, when they say nothing, and they give you that look, you know there's something going on. They're clammed up inside. And what happened is when you clam up, you internalize the anger. Well, that anger, after a while, it's going to blow. And then you have a blow up. And normally when you explode, you explode on the wrong person. You explode at the wrong situation. You explode at the wrong time because you didn't deal with it when it happened. So you can be driven by resentment. You can be driven by fear. Oh, I've seen people. I've seen fear motivate and cause people paralysis where they stove up. They can't leave the house. In 2020, when, when the pandemic hit, we got kids that are four years old now that were uh, literally cocooned by parents that have held them back and they're scared now at four and they they have no life of risk they have no life of pressing through you got to let folk go get that camera off me i'm scared today i'm sorry katie i'm just so mean i apologize <laughs> she'll get on to me later why you do that that's my job to do. i know i know i know but it just i, I get word tongue tied i think I'm, I'm going to make a bad video no no we'll try it again there are people out there that need to hear me. I know, I know. I'm probably the best there is at what I do. Okay. All right, here we go. <laughs> Give me back my sweat towel. I'm up here sweating. Uh, some people are driven by fear. They really are. I I've been driven by fear. Before I was born again, I can tell you, and there's been times over the last 40 years, fear, fear will motivate you. You know, you, you get scared of things, and you've got to remind yourself, stop that. Quit that. Who's your God? Who's your Jesus? How big is your Jesus? Who parted the water? Who walks on the water? Who scattered the stars? Amen. Remind yourself how big he is. And when you do that, all of a sudden the fear starts dissipating and leaving you. These fears may be the result of a traumatic experience, unrealistic expectations, growing up in a high control home where the home was controlling you. And regardless of the cause, fear-driven people often miss great opportunities because they're afraid to venture out. Instead, they play it safe, avoiding risk and trying to maintain the status quo. You know, every time I get on my scooter, I remind myself what's out there. But it doesn't stop me from going forward. And I've heard people, they say it to me all the time, you hear it, be safe, this, that, and the other. It's not about me. I'm going to press in. I'm going to enjoy life because it's, it's, it's in the risk is where the fun is. It's always where the fun is. I, I, you, ever get, you ever put a little kid on a swing? I'm talking about a five, four or five-year-old kid, and you, and you pull the swing back, and you let it go. And the kid looks back at you like, are you stupid? Push me. Push me. Push me. And then you push them. And then they yell, higher, higher. Why? Because it's fun. Yeah, but it's risky. Yeah, if you let go of the chain, you fall backwards and break your neck, five-year-old. I don't care. Push me. And then you push so high that you literally run underneath them, right? Amen. And you let them go. That's, it's inside of all of us to be pushed, to be driven, to go after it, to break fear. Push me. Oh, that's good, preacher. Thank you. Amen. Some people are driven by materialism. Their desire to acquire becomes the whole goal in life. I got to get, got to get, got to get, got to get. And the more you get, the more you want. The more you want, the less you enjoy what you already have. Amen. The more you get, the more you want. The more you want, the less you enjoy what you already have. You know, so, so sometimes you just got to back off and say, you know, I got enough. I got to manage what I have here. Amen. The desire to acquire becomes the goal of their life. The strive to always want more is based on the misconception that having more will make me happy. <laughs> Some people are driven by the need for approval. 
They allow the expectation of parents, spouses, or children, or teachers or friends to control their lives. I, I, listen to me. I believe. I, I want. I, it's not about me pleasing people, but I want people to be pleased with me. Does that make sense? I don't. I'm not out to. I wouldn't be out to please an employer, but I want the employer to be pleased with me. I'm not out just to please my parents, but I want my parents to be pleased with me. You see the difference here? I'm not out just, you, I'm not motivated by your opinion. I just want to make sure that what I'm doing in life, you're pleased with me. I can't please everybody in this church, but I want you to be pleased with me. That, that look, I know what he's doing. Amen. I, he can't please, I can't answer every phone call, I can't get to every hospital, but you understand as your pastor, this is my place right here. I can't counsel everybody. I don't, I don't counsel. I'm not a good counselor. I'm awful at it. I'll offend you. And then I'll charge you money. But if I give you advice, you don't have to take it. Right? He made there's a difference there. See, you can't serve two masters. So what, 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 what drives you? There, there, there are other forces that can drive people's lives, but all lead to the same dead end. Unused potential. Unnecessary stress, an unfulfilled life. And as a pastor, one of the greatest gifts I can offer is showing people how to live lives that are guided, controlled, and directed by God. Nothing matters more than knowing God's purpose for your life. And nothing can compensate for not knowing them. Not success, wealth, fame, or pleasure. And I can't tell you what God's will is for your life. It's not my place. It's not Pastor Joseph's place. You've got to discover it for yourself. And the joy of life is discovering it. It's finding out what it is. Amen. Is it being a good parent, a good employee, employer? Is it uh, serving God in prayer? Some people are really good at prayer. Some people are really good at giving. They, they, matter of fact, it's their life. They love to give. They just give. It's over and above. They're tithing. They just love to give. They, it, they have a gift for it. Proverbs says where there's no vision, people perish. Got to have vision. Everybody say vision. I, I, I was messing with Mr. Ed. He, he's wearing them big goggles. Today, Mr. Ed is the guy on the end with his hands crossed like he's fixing to go to sleep. Uh, and so, Ed, I, he, I said, I like your glasses. He said, I had surgery on my eyes. And I have surgery on my eyes. I've got implants now in my eyes. I forget that I've got them. But they're the coolest things in the world. When I got my first implant, I cried because I couldn't believe I could read the TV again. From me to age, I could read the TV, and I started weeping, and I could see, and, and cars weren't bothering me. And then I got the other eye done, and I thought, it's almost it's just it's amazing that I, inside of this, I got these implants in here. And it helped my vision. Everybody say vision. Vision is so important in life. Without, without vision, where there's no vision, people perish. Without a purpose, a vision, life is motion without meaning. Let me say this to you real, real slow. is motion without meaning. Some folk just moving, but there's no meaning to it. It's activity without direction. You're doing stuff, but there's no direction in it. It's events without reason. Why, why are you going to that? Well, I'm just going to it. But there's no reason for it. You're just, you're just busy in life. It's not helping you. In Scripture, there were many people that expressed hopelessness. Isaiah even said it. The prophet Isaiah. Amen. I've labored to no purpose. I've spent my strength in vain for nothing. When you read the prophets being honest, then they'll correct themselves and say, okay, now I found purpose in life. Job said to say, he said almost the same thing when he made statements like, my life drags by day after hopeless day. You ever felt like your day, your day just dragging by? Hey, man, I, I ain't got nothing going on. That's why I thank God for the church, both churches. You can come here and mow grass and weed eat and clean and work and, and, and do things here or come here and pray and study or come out over here and hang out under the porch with the homeless. Talk with them, share with them. Hey, man, there are things you can do in life. You can find things to do. But when I read what Job is saying here, it, it just affects me. He said, my life just drags by. He also said in the Living Bible, I give up. I'm tired of living. Leave me alone. My life makes no sense. These are things he said. Before he said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. In other words, life has this progression to it where we get to a place. And we've all been there. I'm not, I'm not just belittling any of you for feeling this way. I've been there. 
I've been, I've been so depressed before, I, I, I locked my door and crawled under my desk. I hide from people. Hey, Amen. I just I don't want to be with folk. And then I realized that you got to shake this thing off. you got to come up out of here. Hey, Amen. You, you've got to get up, come out from under the bed. Why? Because you've got to go preach today. Okay. <laughs> the greatest tragedy is not death, but life without purpose. When I do funerals, I look and I say, God, did the deceased have a purpose in this life? And let me be honest, it breaks my heart when I see people's lives and I read the obituary and there's nothing about purpose. Yeah, they were good at this or that, but I don't see no God. I don't see no Jesus. I don't see no anything that lasted. And I got to say to the people in this, even if it offends you, Get a life. Get something that's, that's, that, that makes a difference to somebody. Amen. Pour into people's lives. Be a blessing to them. Even if your right hand don't know what your left hand's doing, do something for them. Be, a, be kind to others. Be forgiven to others. But don't get to the end of this life, and the only thing that people knew of you is you, you were good at riding stick horses. So many in our generation are going through life without a vision, an idea, a plan for their life. For the most part, people just stumble half-heartedly through life, hoping tomorrow will be better than today. No plan, no dream, mostly just existing, hoping for a break. They just keep turning the pages of their life story one after the other until finally they get to the last chapter. Listen. You can't drive without vision. You can't drive without seeing. With vision comes focus. Focus helps me say no to good things and yes to great things. One of the reasons I knew that my eyesight was going is that when I drove at night, I, they, everything was blurry coming at me, and I'd have to turn my head from it. Vision gave me focus. When my eyes got right, I could focus better. Same thing biblically. There are things that are clouding your vision. God, what is it? Help me to have surgery on it spiritually. Amen. So I can focus again. When you can discern what you're supposed to do, you'll know what you're not supposed to do. And if you spend time doing the do's, you won't have time doing the don'ts. Some folk are all about the don'ts. Well, I don't do this and don't do that. Start doing and you ain't got time for the don'ts. Amen. Just do for the things of God. I can't count the number of good opportunities and invitations I've had over the years from good meaning people, but a good opportunity shouldn't distract me from the vision that God gave me. You know, Pastor, if you'll take this job, if you'll sell this, if I can get you to do that, you know, you can make a lot more money than just pastoring. Well, that would take me away from doing what I'm doing. So I, I can't do that. With, with vision comes endurance. John 16, 33, in the world you have trouble. You're going to have trouble in this world. It's just, a, it's just a matter of fact. So you've got to endure very quickly. With vision comes peace. People struggle with anxiety over their identity. What is the big deal right now? I heard one guy say it's like a, an evil fairy waved a wand over America, and all of a sudden people are confused about who they are. Am I a boy today or a girl? Maybe I'm a cat. Meow. And there's no peace. Suicide has gone up because people are struggling with identity. And I look towards Scripture. See, I got, I got to go to the book. I got to have something to stand on. And, you know, I, even if it's offensive to some, I got to have something to stand on. So I stand on this book and I say, God, help me. It, it was you that made me who I am. Uh, you made me male and you made female and you gave me a, who uh, I'm Jerry. You gave me a name. Uh, so it's very important for me. And, and I'm not against people, but I'm not halting between two opinions here. Amen. So they're, when people struggle with anxiety over their identity, their purpose, their significance, it's because they have no vision. They have no vision. With vision, you wake up and you know who you are and why you're here. If you're living your vision, you will live in peace. You will know that you are making the proper terms in life at the proper times, amen, to end up at a desired destination. With vision comes passion. Passion. I like to be around people with passion. I, I, I was very careful with the Olympics. Uh, you know, I know there was some crazy stuff. I didn't throw the baby out with the bath water. I think I watched some of the golf. Because I like Scotty Scheffler, so I was excited about him winning. And and uh, uh, but I, I so I kind of uh, uh, watched some of it. I even walked in yesterday, 
and I sat down sweating after mowing grass, and the Olympics was on. And I thought, well, I'm not going to turn. I'm going, it's basketball. I love basketball. And there was our men's basketball team. There were three minutes left in the game. And so I backslid for three minutes, and I watched the men's basketball. And there's this dude named Curry, who evidently has had a bad showing in basketball or in our Olympics. But I want us to win gold because gold's, gold's – and we're and we, we the best basketball players in the world. And all of a sudden, that young boy went off and shot eight three-pointers. And every one he shot, there was passion. I didn't see him throw up a ball and go, ah. There was excitement, and I just gravitate toward passion when people are excited. And, you know, I, this, this guy here, this guy here, you don't see me, but he, he, he's so passionate about getting to do this and learning that this is me on the front row. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't see it, but he sees me because I'm doing this. Can I? You don't know I'm doing it, but I am telling him. <laughs> it's going to be all right. Bring it down just a notch, and you'll watch it. And then he'll start tuning down just a little bit. He still play it, but, he, but he, he's, he's, he's backing it off. I love passion, though, because passion can be, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, Joseph? Uh, passion can be, con- not, is it controlled or or. No, it's contagious, but passion can be controlled. If there's no fire, you can't do nothing with it. But if you've got passion, you, you can tune it some. You can work with it. And some people, ain't nothing in, ain't no fire in them at all. So you, can't, you can't do this with them because ain't nothing going on in them. They just ain't been buried yet. Uh, D.L. Moody is the guy that's responsible for starting what is known as Sunday schools. D.L. Moody, someone once asked him, he was questioned by his peers why his ministry was so effective. He took him to the window of his upstairs office. Appearing out of a busy city in Chicago, he asked, what do you see? They said, we see people in a park. With tears in his eyes, he said, I see countless souls who will one day spend eternity in hell if they do not find their Savior. Do you know when I got born again, it was almost offensive to me what they were saying, that I was a sinner, that I was going to hell, that my lifestyle was wrong. And I listened to that preacher, and I thought, you know what? I could either get mad and walk out of here, or I could walk up there and ask God to change that in my life. And I decided to walk up there. The Scripture calls it the offense of the cross. The cross has an offense to it. There are people offended with our Jesus. But I want to reach as many people as I can. And some people can be reached with love, and some folk will have to be offended and have to get over it. Okay, I'll just leave that right there. I ain't going no further with y'all. I got to start closing here. But we need a desperate vision. A desperate vision. For vision. Jabez, I love Jabez in Old Testament. I've preached on Jabez for a couple of months. Jabez says, oh! Everybody say, oh. It's just, this is the only verses you got on this guy named Jabez. It just pops into Scripture out of the book of Chronicles. Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. God granted his request. I read that and I thought, that's such a, almost a bold, selfish statement. Oh, that you would bless me. Many of us are so afraid to ask God to bless us. Say it with me. Bless me. Bless me. Say it again. Bless me. bless me. See, there are people out there that ain't going to bless you, but your Father will bless you. All of you would bless me. Enlarge my border. Stretch me out. Did you know this was my prayer when I went to New Caney 21 years ago? All that you, you remember Charlie? All that you would bless me. I went out there all by myself. Then another guy showed up, and people started showing up. And I kept praying, oh, that you'd bless me. And I found this out. When God blesses you, he blesses those around you. Next thing you know, you know what's happened. 
the blessings we've had as a little country. And God granted him his request because he's bold enough to ask. You ain't got it because you didn't ask for it. I keep on walking through Scripture, and I remember when Elijah changed the climate. Remember when Elijah changed the climate? When did climate change take place? It's always been taking place. But Elijah, James chapter 5, verse 16. The New Testament proclaims this of Elijah. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as, that, as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Next verse. Keep rolling. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. We go 10, 12, 14 days without rain. Everything cracks up around here. Elijah said, no rain. No more rain. You know why he did it? Because the nation had turned wicked. They was being ruled by Ahab and a witch named Jezebel. She was manipulative and controlling. She controlled the king. He was a puppet to her. Hmm. Sound familiar? Then when this took place, Elijah said, no more rain. He prayed fervently. The New Testament, James said, he's just a man just like us. So he prayed. And the rain shut down. 30, three years, 12, 24, 36, 42 months, no rain. Then the scripture says, the first Kings chapter 18, I'm going to preach this eventually, but, but the whole story goes like this. Obadiah was a good man. He ran with King Ahab, but he's still a good man in the king's court. He met Elijah and he told Elijah, he said, King Ahab, he wants to kill you. Amen. Jezebel's after you. And Elijah had been hiding himself, hid himself, hid himself. And then Elijah said, well, you tell the king I'll meet with him now. So he met up with the king. He said, I want you to bring the prophets of Baal down. Now, there were Baal and Astrod. That's male and female. These are two type God, uh, 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 wicked um, uh, gods, little G's, that they worshipped around. It was very sexual, very, very wicked times. It was, it was like, we're going to let the nation do whatever the nation want to do. So everything I've seen in America right now, all this uh, uh, perversion, we see it with Elijah. So it hadn't changed a whole lot. So Elijah said, I want the prophets of Baal to come up here. And he actually invited Astroth also, but it doesn't look like Jezebel let him go. And then when he got there, the scripture says that he prayed. Oh, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known to this day that you are the God of Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, oh, Lord, answer me that the people may know that you are God and that you are have turned their back. And they they have turned their backs. Then the fire of the Lord fell. Hold on, Pastor. Don't go there just yet. Let me back up here a verse. Verse 21. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Pick a God. Pick a God. But don't sit here and waver. And the people were quiet. Didn't say nothing. Now, you know what's going on. They cut a bull. They laid it on the altar. They poured water on the altar. This is, this is about sack. Oh, I, I can't preach it. I ain't got time. So they, they put it all on there. And then, the, then he said, let the God who answers by fire. Did you know before this happened, all the prophets had already danced? For, I don't know, six hours, nine hours. They danced around. The, they cut themselves. Uh, he, he, Elijah yelled, your God's asleep. Wake up your God. Y'all keep going. In, in the Hebrew language, it says this. Your God must be relieving himself. See, y'all not ready for the Bible. Y'all be offended over the Bible. The Bible would offend y'all. I mean, he, he's over there taking a leak. Your God, your God, your God's a, yeah, I mean, this is a smart aleck prophet who's confident in God. And then he says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And then this week, midweek service, it hit me. God, help me. I need to be more. I, I don't need to pray more. Some of us think we just need to pray more. It ain't about me praying more. I need to believe 
that what I'm praying, God's going to answer. I want to believe that when I'm praying, I spend a lot of time on tractors and mowers and, 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 and motorcycles and, and in my truck. God, help me that when I'm traveling, that when I'm praying, that I, when I, I believe that there's healing, that I believe the fire falls, that I believe there's still hope for America. Help us be driven by prayer. Help us be driven by purpose. Help us be driven by things other than fear and materialism and all the other things. Elijah, he called on the God of history. He believed that God would answer. Mark chapter 11, Jesus said to people, he said unto them, have faith in God. Whoever says to the mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, it doesn't doubt. God, what's in my heart? This doubt that's in my heart, take this doubt away. Take the doubt of yesterday away. Take the doubt of when it didn't happen away. Take the doubt of hurt away. God, if I have resentment in here toward you, take it away. If I have unforgiveness in here, take it away. Help me to walk in purity of heart that when I pray fervently, it'll happen. Help me pray according to the Word of God, not selfishly, but believing it'll happen. He said, if you'll do this and believe in your heart that that which you spoke, it will come to pass. Therefore, whatever you desire, whatever you're pursuing passionately, when you pray, believe, you'll receive it. Heads bowed, eyes closed. No more games in our prayer life. God, help us be driven pursuing you. <laughs> I am not giving up on America. I love this nation. I love this state. I love this county. I love this town. God, I refuse to give up on people. I've seen you do so many things in the lives of folk that others would say are unredeemable, and you redeemed them. Driven. Driven. If you would meet this morning, you say, Pastor, I want that kind of heart, a passionate pursuit for God to be able to pray and believe and see it happen. Lift both your hands if I'm talking to you right now. I don't need to see your hands. God can look at your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, those watching online, lift your hands right now toward heaven. Oh, I don't care if your husband's watching you right now, watching me with your hands in the air. Say, what are you doing, girl? I got my hands up because I'm believing God. That he's going to change some things. That when I pray, it'll be answered. Because he loves me. He's pursued me. I know because of the cross, he pursued me. He sought me. I didn't seek after him. I could care less about God November the 9th, 1979. But on November the 10th, he pursued me. He found me. God, in Jesus' name. Help us pursue you. Be driven by purpose in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Boy, Boudreaux was a preacher. Don't look at me like that. If you need to tie the offering envelope, our servant leaders are moving forward. I want to thank Tommy and Leon for the exit signs by faith. They ain't got to be lit, just something to see. Uh, next thing. I saw our playgrounds upside down outside. We need a playground. So if you'd like to give over and above, and whether you do or don't, it's not going to change what's going to happen. I'm just giving you an opportunity to be effective. But we need to build a playground. We got to prepare this play. We got little kids come out here. They they want to be pushed in a swing. Higher. We might need to put mulch on the ground. We got to put mulch on the ground out at the ranch because when they flip, then they fall on something a little softer. But you, your hand getting tired? Okay. Scripture says, strengthen the hand that hangs down. Get the hand up there. <laughs> I'll be better in the next service if you want to come. 
But I so appreciate you. I love this church. Amen. And again, I just throw it at you, the playground. I, I wish we had more time. It's hard to divide your time between places coming back and forth. I thank God for those who mow the grass here and take care of stuff here. So if you'd like to be involved in the playground or help out, we'll get one built. Uh, we'll finance it if you'd like to help out with that. I can tell you this. They're very expensive. Playgrounds are crazy. When we built a playground out at the ranch, it's been there, what, 20 years, Kenny? Remember, put, were you there to help put it together? It was a pain. Because I thought, we'll save some money putting it together. And it was like a, a, a puzzle with no instructions. Was you there? It was crazy. Oh, it was crazy. Digging holes in it. But that thing was 20-something thousand just for that playground. But it's been there 20 years. So I guess that's what it is. But it's, it's crazy. But anyway, just throwing it at you. So if you need to tie the offering envelope, you got them in front of you. And as we give today, we believe in God for more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts to molly, royalty, receive favor. Success to you too. Amen.